I'm going to start a little bit about Warburton, and then we're going to go uh, very carefully, very slowly through this text, because it is, uh, it is a strange one. It's a little bit difficult to read. Um, so first, a little bit about Warburton. Um, he lived uh, maybe like 100 years after Hobbes, um, born in 1698, uh, died 1779. He was educated in law, but then he joined the clergy. Um, he became Bishop of Gloucester in 1759. And he published this book um, from which you have been reading um, from 1737 to 1741. It was his sort of main work uh, that he's known for. It was published in two parts, The Divine Legation of Moses. Um, and his, uh, you know, he, was, uh, he was in the clergy. I mean, so he was, uh, he was committed to the church. Um, and his, um, his main um, goal here in this book is to demonstrate uh, against um, the deists who um, uh, propose that God uh, does not intervene directly in the world, he's, he's arguing that yes, God does intervene in the world and, he, and there's such a thing as revelation, which is to say that um, the books of Moses, the, you know, the fir first five books of the uh, Old Testament, were indeed um, you know, a revelation from God given to Moses um, and that um, that our knowledge is not something that uh, we can come up with on our own um, that is somehow general and universal, but really is something that, that's revealed to us um, from, from God, right? And so um, he is, in a sense, uh, somebody who uh, opposes the kind of general direction of thought that Hobbes represents, right? So if Hobbes is, is kind of a uh, a rationalist who wants to, in, set, in a sense, even when he's reading the Bible, um, kind of downplay um, the, the extent to which the Bible is a, is a revelation uh, and emphasizing the way the Bible, in fact, um, is, um, is basically another expression of, of universal laws. Um, Warburton really wants to emphasize um, that revelation is is real and it's something that's different than 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 rationality, right? Uh, and so, re by revelation, we mean you know something that God reveals to us as a you know specific ideas that come from God, right? Um, and so he wants then he's also in his theory of language trying to emphasize the way in which um, language is also something revealed to us from God, right? Okay, so let's go into some of the detail on this. Um, so. If you remember, he, he, you know, he starts out this section on language, and the first sentence, there's a footnote, and there's a very long footnote, and in that footnote, that's where his entire theory of the origin of language uh, is laid out. So it's, it's interesting the way he, he separates his text um, into the main text and the footnote. And in fact, it seems like the footnotes are actually probably, might be even longer than the main text in that section that you're reading, right? Um, so, but let's, we're going to start with the footnote because that's where, you know, he gets into the details of the, uh, of the origin of language. Um, and so, um, he's um, first describing the counterposition, the position that he doesn't agree with, right? And that's, this is in this, in this passage here um, that I'll just read out loud so that we can, we're going to go slowly through this text, right? So, in judging only from the nature of things and without the sure aid of revelation, so, which is to say, if we're just going to look at things just sort of by, by, by kind of rationally and uh, the way Hobbes does, in a sense, and without looking at revelation, without, without looking at what God tells us, right, one should be apt to embrace the opinion of Diodorus Siculus and Vitruvius that the first men lived for some time in woods and caves after the manner of beasts, uttering only confused and indistinct sounds. So, so what he's describing that here is this sort of imagination of how humans must have lived in the beginning, uh, sort of, it's, you know, it's sort of the state of nature where they were kind of like beasts in woods and caves and they, they didn't really have uh, regular language. Until associating for mutual assistance, they came by degrees to, to use such as were articulate for the arbitrary signs or marks mutually agreed on of those ideas in the mind of the speaker which he wanted to communicate to others, right? So um, he's describing this situation where there's these sort of primitive types of humans who are living in caves. They didn't really have regular language, but they needed mutual assistance. They needed to help each other. 
And so because they needed to help each other, they started to use arbitrary signs or marks, so signs that are, you know, that they just sort of picked out that were, um, could have been any kind of mark. And then they mutually agreed upon how those marks should be used um, in order to describe the ideas in the mind of the speaker, right? Um, so, so in order then to communicate and to provide help to each other, right? So that's, that's the, the theory of this sort of uh, state of nature in which language then kind of developed spontaneously through this um, need for mutual assistance, right? And, um, and then the sort of mutual agreement about uh, what signs are supposed to, to, to refer to what, right? Um, so he's, he's laying out this theory um, as a theory that doesn't depend upon revelation. It doesn't depend on God somehow intervening in what's going on. So this is a theory of how humans essentially develop language on their own uh, through these mutual agreements, right? But he's going to reject this theory, right? This is, this is what he um, doesn't like because it doesn't depend on God. Um, so what is his theory? So his theory is that God taught um, language to the first man. And this is essentially what, what Hobbes was telling us before as well. But he, has a, he, he does this a little bit differently. He, I mean, he refers to the same passage, but he does it a little bit differently. So the, the first thing he does is he lays out a couple of arguments kind of in the style of Hobbes about what must have happened uh, or, or what, you know, in the beginning to require this, uh, that God taught uh, the first man language. And so he says, nothing being more evident from scripture than that language had a different a original, right? So this is, this is his continuation. He says, uh, he's going to refer to scripture, to the Bible, to say that, that language didn't um, originate in this sort of state of nature situation. God, we there find, taught the first man religion. And can we think he would not at the same time teach him language? So that's his first reason, right? He says, since God taught religion to the first man, he must have taught that first man language as well, right? And just in the same way that religion is specific, um, it can't, you know, you, you can't just um, develop religion just through rationality, right? You can't, you have to, you have, to, there, there has to be revelation. There has to be, you, you can't know about, you know, Adam and Eve. You can't know about Jesus Christ without something happening in the world that's specific. You, you can't rash, rationally come up with those ideas of religion. He is saying that language is also the same way that it's, it's not a result of general principles, but it's a result of, of a very specific revelation and development then um, that, can't, you know, that you can't deduce um, from abstract principles, right? So that's, that's the first argument that he says, just like religion is based on revelation, language also must be re based on re revelation in the, in the sense that um, when God was teaching um, the first humans, religion, they, he must have also taught the first humans um, uh, language. Then he goes on, he says, if it be said we might gain language by the use of reason, it may be replied, so he might religion likewise, and this much easier and sooner, right? Um, again, when God created man, he made woman for his companion and associate, but the only means of enjoying that benefit was the use of speech. Can we believe that he would leave them to get out of the forlorn condition of brutality as they could, right? So this is the second reason that he provides for us. And this is more, I suppose, uh, a kind of abstract reasoning kind of uh, argument because he's saying since God created woman uh, as well as man, he would have had to have given them language in order uh, to provide them a basis for their relationship, right? So, but I mean, he's, he's in a sense, he's taking, like, like Hobbes did before, taking a passage from the Bible describing this, um, this, the origins of the first man and the first woman, and then extrapolating from that in order to say, well, um, God must have then given them languages or, or else they would not have had a proper relationship, right? Um, so th those are the first two arguments that he presents, um, which are arguments in which he's trying to emphasize the way in which language is given by God. Then he goes into this much more elaborate explanation of the particular passage. Now you recall, um, Hobbes referred to this same passage um, in, in Genesis where they talk about um, God bringing the beast to Adam and Adam um, 
w was, was named the beasts, right? A and you recall Hobbes didn't really have a very elaborate reading. He, in fact, he didn't even quote the passage. He just kind of referred to the passage as his evidence for why God um, must have uh, taught language to Adam. Um, Warburton is going to look at this passage. Also, he quotes the passage, and he gives us a much more elaborate explanation. So let's, let's take a look at what he says here, okay? Um, but we have um, more than probability of this opinion, right? So, so he, you know, previously he gave us these reasons, and now he says it's not just probability of this opinion, the express testimony of Moses, right? So the, this, the words of Moses, if I'm not much mistaken, that God did indeed teach men language, right? That he's saying that it's, you know, these words of Moses, this testimony of Moses is what gives us this information, as revelation, right, words of God through Moses, right, that God didn't teach men language, the place I mean is this. And he, and he quotes this passage, well, we'll go ahead and read this again. And God brought every beast of the field and every fowl of the air unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, creature that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to fowl of the air and to, the, to every beast of the field. Now, if you remember when we talked about this passage, when we talked about Hobbes, um, you recall, we looked at this and we said, you know, it says here um, that God brought all these beasts to Adam to see what he would call them. And then what, whatsoever Adam called every creature, that was the name thereof. It doesn't really say that God taught Adam language, right? It doesn't really say that. It just says he brought the beasts there and Adam um, gave them names. And, and so that is a kind of objection to what Hobbes was saying. And in fact, here, Warburton responds to that exact objection. He says, um, here, by a common, I mean, so, so he says, yeah, yes, it's literally, it's not saying that God taught animal language. But then he says, here, by a common figure of speech, the historian, instead of directly relating the fact that God taught men language, represents it by showing God in the act of doing it in a particular mode of information. Right, so he's saying, no, it doesn't really say literally that God taught animal language, right? But what it does do is it uses a figure of speech to represent how this must have happened, right? He show, the, the passage shows God in the act of doing it, not explaining that God did it, right? So he's, he's emphasizing the way that the, the, the Bible uses figures of speech, metaphors, uses different um, types of, um, I guess, analogies and yeah, figures in order to communicate information. He says that this is a particular mode of information, right? So it's a mode of information that's not just a sort of explicit declaration, but a use of a figure of speech. And then he says, and that the most apposite we can conceive in elementary instruction, namely the giving names to substances, things with which Adam was to be most conversant and which therefore had need of being distinguished each by its proper name. And can anything be more familiar than the image these words give one of a learner of his rudiments? And God brought every beast, etc., to Adam to see what he would call them. In a word, the prophet's manner of relating this important fact has, in my opinion, an uncommon elegance. Right. So he's he's noting that what's going on here is that we're, that the Bible is describing the scene in which God is teaching language. It's not describing, it's not saying that God is teaching them, but it's, it's giving us this scene. It's giving us a scene of God presenting the beasts and Adam naming them. And so it's really like a little, a little drama, a little, uh, a little, yeah, I guess a little image. And he's saying that image is really what we're supposed to extrapolate from to say that this is the image of a learner learning some basic things, right? And through this image, the, the Bible is then speaking to us in order to tell us that God taught animal language, right? So, um, so what he's emphasizing first um, is that figures of speech are really, in, in a sense, the primary, one, one of the ways, anyway, maybe not the primary, but maybe one of the primary ways in which, uh, in which the Bible reveals knowledge to us, right? And that this particular passage is giving us this picture of the learning situation, of this basic learning situation, and that's how we know that God taught Adam language, right? So, um, so you, you see that the method he's using is actually one in which he's interpreting the Bible in a sense the way Hobbes was, but he's giving us, I guess you could say, a much more detailed um, reading in order to, to provide 
uh, or in order actually to provide the warrant for his for his evidence. And so, um, you know, this this whole explanation that he has of the evidence that's essentially kind of part of his his warrant. And so, and, and what's interesting about Warburton is that he's um, he's actually very unique in, in the sense that his arguments are very carefully laid out. He's got his claim, his reasons, his evidence, and warrant. It's all sort of in a row. Um, and we'll, I'll, I'll, we'll go into that a little bit later, um, but it's, it's helpful then for us to, to be kind of learning this process, right? Um, um, so j just to sum up then, be in between Hobbes and, and, and Warburton, we have two different warrants uh, two different that, that lay out two different reading strategies, right? So in, um, if, if in Hobbes, he's talking about sort of logical inferences from what the Bible actually says, and then, he, he, and he, then he, he's actually focusing on this whole naming process and, and the creation of definitions, right? So you recall he, he said, um, you know, in, in his reading of that Bible passage, he just says the first author of speech was God himself, and he instructed Adam how to name such creatures as he presented to his sight. Didn't really go into any of the details of it, but then he does say later on, for I do not find anything in the scripture out of which directly or by consequence can be gathered that Adam was taught the names of all figures, numbers, measures, colors, sounds, fancies, relations. And so he says um, that that was left out in the Bible, and we can fill that in as a kind of logical consequence, right? And so he's, 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 he's arguing sort of with logic, taking some of the pieces of the Bible, but kind of integrating them within a kind of logical, uh, rational conception, which focuses on definitions of names as sort of the basic function of language, right? And, th and, and you, know, if, you know, that was one of his big theses, but really it also, in this case, it really functions as one of his warrants in the sense that um, this is the way he's going to be interpreting a lot of the things that he sees. He's going to be interpreting things in terms of how they, uh, how they establish basic definitions that are sort of the correct definitions of what's going on, right? Warburton, he's not so much focused on kind of the, 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 the logical continuity of what's going on. He's, um, he's going beyond the price, I mean, he's reading the precise words of the Bible, but he's going beyond them by, uh, by looking at the different figures of speech that are being used, the kinds of metaphors, the kinds of images that are being used, and using that as the, as, as the way to read his evidence. And he's also, by extension, um, I think we can say that one of his basic warrants is, is one in which he's um, focusing on language as figure of speech and not so much as definition, right? And so um, as we go through his, you know, his, his entire um, section on language, we see he's constantly giving us these examples of different metaphors, similes, um, uh, different images um, that language produces and, and trying to explain how those things function, okay?